Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Stephanie Valdez, and I'm the store owner. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you for spending the evening with us. I'm thrilled today to welcome Edie Madoff for the release of Another Love Discourse in conversation with Claire Massoud. Now to some housekeeping. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. If your version of Zoom is up to date, you can hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll be asking those sometime during the program, so don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I'll be posting a link to tonight's book, as well as some other information throughout the event. We have a great lineup of events planned for you this spring and summer. You can go to our website and find out. Um, in particular, we'll have Ibram X. Kendi in person on Monday, June 13th. So now a little bit about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Called an American original, Edie Madoff is the author of the prose collection, Kingdom of the Young and novels including Lola California and Crawl Space. Her previous work has been recognized by the Bard Fiction Prize and the Kafka Prize and has received support from the Fulbright Program, the Howard Foundation, the Lannan Foundation and the Whiting Foundation. A senior editor at the journal Conjunctions, she teaches in the MFA program at the University of Massachusetts at the Amherst. Claire Massoud is the author of seven works of fiction, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Emperor's Children and The Burning Girl, and a book of essays, Kant's Little Prussian Head and Other Reasons Why I Write. She is the recipient of Guggenheim and Radcliffe Fellowships and the Strauss Living Award from the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Letters. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you both so much for being here and I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Edie, for being here this evening. It is so exciting to celebrate um, the arrival in the world of your amazing new book. And um, and uh, what's the is it? When was the publication date? Is it just like yeah. a week? No, I know it. It's somehow fittingly. First of all, just thank you, Claire. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, amazing community. Um, community is actually. I just have to say, quick aside, is linked to my having children because I was years ago grading student papers when I was teaching at the new school. It was 1 p.m. and uh, I was like, I really mean this. I was, I think I was 30. It was like my biological clock went off at 1 p.m. at the clock. <laughs> and I was like, all this energy I'm putting into students, you know, I could be putting that to children. So I sort of feel there's like full circle and having the real launch with me. Yes, the publication date. Um, the books were delayed on a steamer from Estonia. Um, they are now in a penguin warehouse. Community with its great cachet was able to get some for tonight. Others may be coming soon. Um, but yeah, it has felt like a COVID birth process having these books come out. Yeah. So yeah. June 21st is the official date, but you know, it seems like there are some slowly circulating out to these bookstores. Uh, which, ma which makes actually, which makes it just in this moment, a little like semestat, <laughs> right. which, which seems real, which seems sort of fantastic and kind of, um, and kind of, and kind of appropriate. I, you know, I, um, that you in 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 the book you you quote oh no I'm sorry it was in the interview there's a wonderful interview that you did with the Brooklyn Rail um, that is just up I think is that it's new just out and it just um, came out yeah today and I highly recommend it to anybody everybody and you, but you in it you you quote Brodsky's um, Nobel speech in um, in which he said a poem in particular but fiction prose addresses uh, a man tete a tete entering with him entering with him into direct, free of any go-between relations. Such, such warm immediacy, you said, this was what I wanted with the reader, and hence use truncated forms, interruptions, direct address. And, um, and, and you know, all your no books are amazing. This one is so particular, and, and I feel like it's so, um, the address is so immediate, and it seems then appropriate that, that, that the books should be passing hand to hand Right in in some in some sort of special, almost secret way. I shouldn't say that because, of course, we don't want our books to be secret. We write 
to communicate, but 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 just as a sort of first little um a first little handing around. I mean, it it feels so personal. Maybe maybe I could um start start by asking about the genesis of the book for you. Yeah, thank you. It's so um I just have to say it's such a treat to be in Claire's capacious consciousness. Um, and I know we're shining light on this book, as she said to me nicely right before, but she just came out with a dream life and I actually got to interview her for the rumpus. So please, it's a wonderful book that she wrote 20 years ago. Um, but um, okay, uh, the genesis of this book was that, and I am gonna just apologize in advance. I had neurological Lyme last summer. My face froze up, my brain froze in as such. Sometimes words freeze and sometimes I get emotionally labile. No one would have called me a stoic before, but some things could make me tear up. So I say this ahead. Um, so just like all of us, I was trying to survive during the pandemic. Um, I, suddenly I was responsible for maybe seven beings in this kind of rambly parsonage into which we had lived. So this is a novel. It departs from my life. There's a narrator. The facts are not my facts, but I use, you know, I really actually, I guess, to be honest, um, I had been, I had started to feel a little like writing novels was like being, not that I play chess really um, at all, um, but like kind of like being like a chess player moving characters and a little bit, you know, and I think this is perhaps an occupational hazard if you've been teaching creative writing or engaged with this vast system of words and opinions that is literature, reading literature, writing literature, where, you know, there's this kind of self-referential quality and one can be in that system of knowledge and sort of, you know, I think I felt that I was moving characters around as if on a chessboard and I really wanted to do something different. Um, and shake myself up as if I hadn't already been shaken up by the pandemic and by, you know, um, in my case, like the loss of my mother, divorce, you know, um, all sorts of things. So I was at the time teaching this, um, teaching a lover's discourse in a class called Rants and Confessions at UMass Amherst in the MFA where I teach. And um, by the way, I do this weird thing every semester where I present maybe 50 books summarized to my students on a theme. And then I leave the room and I say, you choose the nine books we're gonna focus on to keep the teaching new for me. And so that they're more, not to use a stock metaphor, but stakeholders in the knowledge. And so we were reading a lover's discourse and it was a really small class, it was four people and it was on Zoom. It was that first semester when, so it was essentially like right now I only see you and sometimes I see Stephanie. It was, it was that intimate. And I started to, I always have loved aleatory prompts. Like I, early on back in college, I would use the I Ching, you know, as a kind of scaffolding or not to resist kind of it in that kind of John Cage way. And just also because writing can be a really less than generous medium, not like film or painting or dance or singing or theater where you have the material itself to respond to. Um, and so I love bringing in, you know, I know some writers who will open up 10 books and use them in aleatory fashion to respond to. Um, so anyway, I always started to use Roland Barthes categories in a lover's discourse. And each day I would just give myself a small thing, like write whatever is true, you know, or whatever is authentic. And I will say that um, there's a lot of stuff that has been thrown out of this book. I mean, it was a big galumphing elephant. And then I think I'm gonna maybe publish some of them on a sub stack, which I'm gonna revive. Um, but um, I will also say that, so I, you know, this plucky publisher, Terra Nova, MIT Press, Evan Eisenberg, the editor, took a chance on this book. Um, but I will say that I was finishing, I've never had a book um, go so quickly to press. It was for sale on, sorry, Amazon and, um, you know, Target 
before I was done with it. Wow. And <laughs> just really felt anxious. So the book is kind of, it didn't allow me to do the like, ref, you know, probably there's that thing of, you know, like the, ha- not the half finished work, but you know, the, sometimes people do better when it's a demo track or they do better when it's a sketch. So this is sort of quite raw. It's, it was my desire to reach the reader and, it, and I couldn't put on my gloss and varnish. But, but it's interesting. That seems again totally appropriate for the for the for the type of book that it is, because because it it is um, precisely uh, you know to, to return to that Brodsky quote. I mean, it's about immediacy and connection, and and I mean, you use the word authenticity, and I think you know. The, I mean, there there are there are um, there there are. I feel we're in a moment where I think the frustration you express with the the sense of moving uh, characters around like pieces on a chessboard, um, that's some, that's something that I think a, a lot of writers are are feeling in different and 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 the reactions to that are, are can be quite different. I mean, it's not there 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 there's a there are a lot of diverse responses to that, um, but 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 in that in that sense, the the immediacy. Um, precisely not to be varnished seems part of the immediacy, right? It seems it's kind of essential to the to the truth of the narrative. The, you know, you one of the um, I, we're going to have to. I, I, we have so many things. I want you. I want you to read. I want to. But we've got to get a little a little sort of Roland Bart in here, um, just because I I, um, I I I assume many people will be familiar with um, the the. The book to which uh, your title refers, um, and, and to some of Bart's ideas, but but I, I what comes to mind just at this moment is the um, is the plaisir jouissance distinction that you that you um, write about or you articulate in the in in the book about about the different experiences of reading and one being a writerly reading um, in which you're, you're you're one being more passive, the plaisir being more passive, and the jouissance being if you will, to return to our college, we went to college together, guys, um, to return to our college conversations in the moment of French psychoanalytic feminism, you know, to be to being the, the as it were, the what was at the time referred to as the sort of feminine experience of the multiple orgasm, um, which, which, which was <laughs> with the sense of that being a, a, a different narrative trajectory, an alternative to the, to the, to the, um, Traditional arc um, that 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 had perhaps one peak. Um, so so I, um, yeah, I, maybe maybe you'd like to say a little. I don't know if it's a place. I don't. The narrator in this wonderful book has ha, is supposed to have been writing a book about Bart for some time. That is the book Unwrit, and um, and and Bart looms large in her consciousness. And I don't know whether uh, um, that maps in any way to your actual. Um, experience, but maybe maybe you could sort of um, give give people a little sense of the role of Bart um, as a presence uh, here. So you mean in the book or in my life? Um, well, either I mean certainly in the book, and then I mean in the book, but 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 may, I, I mean I'm just curious whether that's also there's one of the other things. This book has has so many witty and funny, um, you know, it's so playful, and I, and and I love this. Three Shakespeare classes and and the, and the overdetermined. Uh, Bart- Maybe I should read that section. Would that be? A, I just have to find it. That's yeah. a pro- yeah. That's a problem because the book got shifted around so radically. Um, maybe you can riff and I'll find that section. Um, well, anyway, the, this just about about how all the professors. I must have that. I must have that. But it'll be the wrong page number in my notes. Um, but but about all the professors had uh, had had perhaps too strong a, a, an influence from Bart, and and how Othello, uh, will you read to us about Othello uh, and your experience of uh, of studying Othello, which which is both wonderful and <laughs> and somehow uh, it's its own thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You know what? I'm not going to be able to find it. Um, there were so many, but. Um, so many shifts at the last moment. Um, but yes, to answer your question, yeah. So what Claire's referring to, there's a um, there's a section in which, and this is actually from my life in our college, um, that you know, 
it, it was a year of this like kind of hypersexualization of reading. Like I also remember this thing about Derrida and language is a trace, which is like the masturbatory leftover, right? And all that. Um, and these professors were kind of highly charged individuals. They seem kind of turgid with their ideas, you know, in some way. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I craved authenticity, I guess. And I kept taking Shakespeare classes in college. So this is true. This is similar to the narrator in another love discourse. And in none of them could I find anything about Shakespeare. It's like I wanted people to talk about Shakespeare. And so I took one class in which all the professor talked about for 13 weeks was how the O in Othello is the O, which is like the proscenium arch, which is like the O of absence, which is like the O of orgasm, which and just, it just went on and on. So like, you know, no Shakespeare, but lots of O. And, um, you know, I, what, what is that about? It's sort of like, kind of, it's again, kind of going to something that actually Bart would have loved. I mean, it's this emptiness of signs. Um, so, you know, in answer to your question, sort of more autobiographically, I actually did not really read Bart so much in college. It was after I fell in love with mythologies, his really slim book, where he yep, does yep. things like he talks about Greta Garbo's face, like, deconstructing it, or will say things like, um, the striptease or striptease artist is closed by her professionalism or it's just a it's just a beautiful book and I really actually believe he has influenced a lot of the people people are reading that you know like I can see a really direct line of descent in so a lot of my students once they read it used to be that when students read David Foster Wallace or George Saunders I would know and I would actually know like a treating when in their formation they'd read it but now I know when in their formation they read Maggie Nelson, who is a direct descendant of Bart. And, you know, it's sort of this braided narrative where you have kind of a, you know, just this presentation of like personal life and then kind of going into the theory. And I think I have resisted the separation of theory from life. And I often am teaching my creative writing classes with some kind of theory because it gives people a way to, um, it's like a dowsing broad um, to get through the very complex identity issues of our time. And so Bart, who struggled so much with embodiment, you know, he was just chronically ill, but then also was a kind of semi-closeted gay man, you know, just somehow I think I just think he's the best. I love him. He is so exactly what you said. He's so playful. And so, and so, you know, another thing related, uh, you know, for me, I did not realize how closeted he was until I began writing this book or semi-closeted. But, you know, um, in the book, there is a thing where the narrator gets told, you know, sweetheart, you're just like me. You're a gay man in a woman's body. And I very early on did identify, um, you know, growing up in San Francisco in the latter moment of, you know, pre, pre everything AIDS, you know, act up. I just really felt that um, I kind of, I just felt myself to be an unidentified boy somehow, but it wasn't quite a boy. So it was before there was this kind of terminology for all that. I always feel everything is a drag, like adulthood is a form of drag we put on or, you know, and that just, I really love what Bart has to say about drag. So, but this was more like a later discovery for me. Right, I, I, as you're speaking of that, and when I was reading in the book, I was reminded, I don't know, one of the other things that in, back in the college days, I can't remember in what class um, was, um, was Jacques Rivière's Femininity as Masquerade did you read that? So he's, um, which I feel is, is, you know, about the performative nature of femininity and so on. And, but I was really struck by um, a moment in which the narrator, um, not to, not to um, make a, um, some conflation, but then uh, between you and the narrator, but, but the narrator writes about writing in, a, writing from a male point of view. Um, and, and, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's a very, um, to me, to me, uh, you know, 
I, I think you, you, you have the narrator suggest some reasons why that might be so. Um, but, but, but I think, you know, it, it, and they're, and they're, and they're quite practical reasons, but I think it's all, but, but, but it's also a matter of in our, in our moment, in our exact generation, I think of, of seeing that really as, as freedom, right. As a writer. I mean, I, I remember being aware that Elizabeth Bishop refused to be, had refused to be included in an anthology of women poets because she said, I'm a poet. I'm just a poet. Um, and, and, and this, um, the, the desire to be ungendered was perforce male, you cool. know, 30 that, years ago. That is so accurate. I was actually just telling, I just came from this incredible like retreat place called Hambidge in Georgia. And I was telling some people that, um, it suddenly came back to me somewhere in grad school. This is kind of an embarrassing story to tell. I, I was an art critic briefly, um, just because I was sort of, you know, I studied painting in college. And um, I wrote, yeah, exact, very much in that line, I wrote a piece about an incredible show of women's paintings. Um, and I just said, you know, I don't think they should all be ghettoized together because it was really quite different, different levels of talent and expressivity. And then the, I got a call from the editor saying the Gorilla Girls, you know, those women who dressed up in girl costumes were, were at the gallery protesting what I'd written, which I felt was sort of a fem, you know, a, a gesture exactly of freedom, you know, um, offering, saying, you know, people's art should not be defined in that. It's very interesting what you're saying. It's, it is a little bit of a, you know, we, do, we walked over a narrow bridge in terms of that generational understanding. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was such a, um, such a moment. I'm, I'm, I, and, and I think it's so, you know, it, obviously it's so a completely different moment now, but I, but I, I feel as though I wasn't sort of fully tracking the moments in between. So I'm not, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure at what, at what moment, you know, I'm not sure how the, how the evolution, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the, there's a direct line from the Gorilla Girls, I think, to a sort of more general understanding in our moment. Um, in this moment now, but, uh, but, but, but aware, I, I'm just, I'm aware of the time is just zipping by in this kind of terrifying way. And I want to be sure, um, I wondered if you might read a little bit for us. Um, and, and, um, and I know we, we, we couldn't find the, the Othello, uh, Othello moment, but, but perhaps you might read for us a little that will give us some, um, some, a sense of both the Roland Bart uh, presence and and also of the, if you will, um, embodied concreteness um, that that is that is um, that the the and the playfulness that is that is in this book. So um, we um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, all right. I, okay, so we were just thinking of this one section. Um, by the way, dear audience, whom we can't see, if you want to guess. If you want to make a number anywhere from five to three twenty, I will also read that page. So maybe we could just take the first one of that. Um, but okay, so this is from page one twenty. Um, so there's the narrator's talking about how she realized that Grace Paley basically formed her idea of what a romantic partner should be. You don't look half bad, you know, says one of the men of Paley. Don't laugh, you ignorant girl. I bought real butter for the holiday and it's rancid. So then it's the narrator's voice. Before I met Vegas mate, working as a butter fingered waitress, not yet knowing what undergirded my romantic life, I found three lines of Roland Bart spoke to my soul, such as it was. I am interested in language because it wounds or seduces me and Language is a skin. I rub myself against the other. And you see, the first thing we love is a scene. A scene then. Imagine you find yourself walking after your undegree, the long hazard, sorry, hazard tape stripe of beach in Los Angeles, near where you once traveled with mother to Muscle Beach. But you are thinking of Roland and his love of looking at cultural products as a series of myths extolling power structures of capital 
or desire, and random men shake themselves free from archetypal self-improvement routines to rake you with comments. I'm an idea person. How about you? Very often said in LA. Or how's your workout shaping up? Among other jobs at that time, I had a small radio show. Occasionally, I interviewed commentators, interrogators, a means of flipping the vector to rub myself against the other of Los Angeles. Everyone there had invented everyone else. Everyone was an idea person. Each day asked you to contact the loving gaze of your own self-appointed church, a babe lost in the American wilderness of self-improvement, and the populace let you know your coordinates on their map. Whom again did I interview? The short, okay, I'm just, I'm sorry. This, I shouldn't be cracking myself up with my own writing, it's terrible. But okay, I'm gonna try. It, it, it's, it's pretty darn good, keep going. <laughs> okay, the short inventor of liposuction with his handlebar mustache, plus his fast talking genius girlfriend, allegedly his favorite work in progress with her well contoured cheeks and lips of rubber, nay Celtic, most resembling an anime doll. She professed herself a lover of form. Also, the speed adult self anointed body fluid sprayer boy inventor of performance art, the genial billboard model who invented contemporary dog walking, the blockhead heir to the Dayglow legacy, see in the dark, no one knew how before me. Asking them to be on the show undid society's catcall. They stepped through the black cloaked hall into the studio with touching displays of vanity, preening before the two-way mirror, and so becoming even more archetypes in the most transient time in my life, the signified become the sign. You could not help but be moved by the varieties of human vanity, my own included. By making myself transparent, I was also vain. Everyone is raw at heart. They entered, I established audio levels, and their comments rose out of the vast bubbling fear we all keep while guarded inside. To see in the dark, infinite hope tickle the edge of tomorrow's cosmos. Imagine. You interviewed all these inventors, sidekicks, and appurtenances, and then submitted this document of discourse on cassette tape to a producer, and somehow this served as one of your more legit post-college jobs. Between interviews, I played music I loved. No one made any profit. That these recordings served any part of the common good was as apparent to me as to the makers of American cheese. The work of the studio time ended up beamed out somewhere over Iowa cornfield by something called the American Radio Network. Maybe a lone corn hand heard some of my ridiculous questions, driving his truck after a hard day's labor, following the dashed yellow line that led nowhere. Maybe migrants working over soiled amber factory floor heard the static between the self-regard of my interlocutors and my wish to get them to speak their bare truth degree zero. It is hard to penetrate between a person and their own idea of themselves, the hazardous task of both hairstylists and writers. Okay, I'm going to just stop there. That's just, it's just wonderful. Everything about it is so, um, the, the, the prose is so fabulous, but, but also the, um, the evocations and, and, and this moving, which this, this sort of slide, which seems to me so, um, well, barked like but also um so essential to this book this slide between the 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 abstract or intellectual or mythic and and the very specific and concrete which which um you know those guests those guests i can i can see uh i can see and and sort of feel i get feel each one of them um e even as they're even as they're um they're if you will mythical they're not they're not. Uh, they're they're the opposite of generic, and 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 it, and it seems to me, um, well, I I um, I have some well, okay because I, I, I I'm about to lead it off in a different direction rather than this passage. So I, I actually want, I wondered if you wanted to say anything um, about about this passage in particular, and maybe before because I I, I wanted to move on to the mother 
um, the mother and mothers and 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 daughters, um, which seems to me, you know, there's there's it is there are many ways in which that 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 important theme or strand is 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 interwoven with with bar, the barges on, but but it's also it's incredibly earthly, right? As a, as opposed to heady. I feel that the mother, the mother sections, um, you know, are, so I want to come to that. I'm not being very articulate, but, but first I, I just want to um, pop back to the beginning of what you read from um, and, and, and those three sentences um, that you, that you quote, the three lines of Roland that spoke to my soul, such as it was, I'm interested in language because it wounds or seduces me. Language is a skin. I rub myself against the other, um, which, which is, um, which is erotic, right? And and you see, the first thing we love is a scene. So I, I, I wondered, um, how did you choose those three lines, and um, and and do they, for you, have echoes um, throughout throughout the novel um, that you'd like to share? Yeah, what a nice question. Gosh, everyone, you should just like hire yourself out to be an interlocutor yourself. I mean, I guess you do do that. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, I am interested in language because it wounds or seduces me. Okay, so I'm just going to take that for a sec, which is that, um, so, you know, as a child, I spent hours getting on my feelings quite lonely, often playing, improvising at the piano. And, you know, I had some very brief, like, classical training, work with a composer, etc. But um, you know, so I do, I realize that I really experience writing as if I'm playing at the piano. And so it's, you know, that whole thing, theme and, you know, so it's not like I'm saying counterpoint, but I do feel there's something about this book where I wove it together differently than other books. And it's about the, um, so I was just interviewed by this nice, person who may be in our room right now, Leora Skolkin Smith, who said, well, you know, it feels like it's more integrative, you know, that's, that's what you're interested in. It's hard to take a section out of this book. And so one thing I found is that you sit at a table of anyone who professes to be a writer, and maybe this is also true of those who profess to be a reader, whatever that, you know, exact identification is, but most people have had some issue with speech at some early stage. And so, you know, it's really fascinating to me who's had a stammer, who was in a bilingual household, who, you know, there's so many, I, I could actually just talk for an hour about this, but just be, what are the case? When I was a kid, I felt quite mute and uh, it was only truly in grad school. And so this is also coincides with the narrator who's not me, but she, you know, there is some thing of sort of beginning to learn how to speak through writing. I could speak one on one, but I did not know how to speak to groups. And, you know, I think also, you know, there is a kind of Stockholm syndrome in my psyche. And also I was raised in this kind of Buddhist energy of Northern California where, so it sort of intellectually reified what was a dispositional bent, which is sort of like, a kind of absolute relativism, like, I guess you all are right. Why do I need to speak up? You know, um, I was the youngest of three. So then I came to the East Coast and I really also could talk a lot about the difference between California and the rest of the world. But, um, and people really seem to stake their identity in their verbal expression, and they're very strong in their opinions. And it was greater culture shock for me than years later when I lived for a few years in Sri Lanka. I just really could not understand the kind of egoic, it, it, I was impressed by it, but I, it just seemed quite foreign. So there's some part of me that always finds language, verbal language, and now it's intensified by having had this neurological line. It just feels performative. So it's a language is a wound language is, is, a, is a skin, you know, these things, I am interested in language because it wounds or seduces me, you know, and yet I'm so 
moved when somebody uses language in a connotative with connotative fields that speak to my kind of inchoate childlike understanding of memory, memory and metaphor both. Um, you know, you mentioned Elizabeth Bishop and there's something about these writers like Elizabeth Bishop who, for example, you know, her questions of travel, you know, such a clear writer and it just speaks to my soul as if they have some incredible moral force. Whereas this book that I wrote, it has some kind of, it's kind of a testament to my absolute relativism. It's, I wanted to invite the reader in and have this intense connection through language while also deconstructing it to use the word from our press. Right. That, that, that makes a lot, that, that makes a ton of sense. And it, and it, and it is in that sense, um, the, the form of it is sort of anti-hierarchical, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it, it is an invitation to, to discourse or dialogue. So, I mean, the, the, the fact that it is, um, and, and, and I, 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 there are all these questions that people have asked and so I've got to, I want to turn to some of your questions folks and I, but I, I, I just want to raise one tiny question, which is, um, the Bart's book is called A Lover's Discourse and your book is called Another Love Discourse. And th there is a there is a, a an echo, but it is a, that is distinct. It is not it, the the R is gone. It's not a lover. It's a love. And and I wondered if you might just say quickly. And then, guys, I promise, um, I'm uh, the the answer. Your questions are about to be um, put to to the broader group. So, um, do you have any? Do, do, do you have yes. anything? Yes, yes, yes. So I think it goes again with this feeling I have sometimes of an allergy toward, an allergy to being stuck in a carapace of identity. So for example, for years, I would not say I was a writer. In fact, I still sort of feel allergic to that. I like, I like to say I am writing, I'm writing a novel. Um, I think I am suspicious of myself whenever I take on an identity which, to, which others accord value to. Um, so a lover's discourse, you know, in, in the case of his book, you really feel his anguish as a lover. You feel there are all, all these fleeting lovers are kind of unnamed and they're kind of hungry and left. And, you know, because this book, Another Love Discourse, is, has something to do with, um, so, or so much to do with motherhood, you know, my own and being a daughter and, um, you know, just also this kind of self-suspicion I had until I had a baby. I we used to say to myself, you know, um, or I would wonder, you know, am I really loving? Do I know how to love? And then my first daughter appeared and I, I really mean it like, I mean, right after she was born, I, um, it was like a stencil laid on all prior experience. And I was like, oh. I was loving all those years, it, but it sort of took that as an illustration or, you know, that moment. So yeah, another love discourse so that it's not greater or it's not an identity. It's exactly what you say. It's a, a cooperative relation with the reader that we're thinking about love together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do, you know, it's something I think it's so interesting that I feel is, is so in sympathy with the things that you're saying and I um I'm I'm actually just sitting down to read a uh uh it's not yet published but it's upcoming an Elias Canetti reader that's coming out. Um and I and I haven't read a much um Canetti in the past but but of course you know he, so much of what he was writing towards or writing against was the the blunting of um of human experience by by uh, categories and definitions, right? And, no, and so I want to read that then. Yeah, and so and, and so I've, I feel as though that that actually, which is, seems to me one of the 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 big questions of our time is 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 how to honor the individual 
specificity um, of, of experience in all its in all its manifold forms and 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 love is one of those I, I sorry I'm on a little riff here but I feel as though we're in this moment where love has uh, has been so frequently or so broadly sexualized right that 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 it's one of the things I really love about this this book is that the intensity of a love discourse has many different many different valences and and many different possibilities and to to be a daughter to to be a mother to be a um you know to be a a, a thinker um to love roland bart right that these are these are all forms of love that 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 don't need in some way to be measured against some sort of sexualized romantic desire um, and and I, I really appreciate and love that in this narrative. Thank you for saying that. I, can I just say one last thing? So I, you articulated a kind of ethos for me, which I'm now going to use in the future. But I realized, you know, when you were talking, I thought. So I wrote this book, Lola California, which was about the friendship between two girls. And in general, I just really want to see the romance the atypical romance described in literature. It's like a hunger I have. Yeah. Anyway. Absolutely. So so I would just say that that one of our, our, our group, Jim Carpenter, has wonderfully found the Othello passage. So let's come back to that in, in a moment. Um, but but Karen is asking, Edie, do you have an ideal reader? Um, also, how do you think those who lack your knowledge of theory will respond to this? novel yeah that's such a good question um first of all i don't have a lot of knowledge of theory i really it's like i'm broad like low decibel broad bandwidth you know i'm kind of conversant but i'm not i'm an, i'm not a deep theory person um so you know there's even there's a point in the book where um so it's illustrated with these photographs mainly by this wonderful dutch woman cecile boucher who lives along the highway along highway five in the desert and this with the big wonderful hands and laugh and she um but there's a point in the book where the narrator describes and in truth as if to someone like cecile it gives a kind of bart recap like in a really like straightforward way like this is the, these are the basic concepts of Bart that are useful here. Um, but, you know, I don't, I'm not using all of Bart. I'm just using the really, like the, the a few maraschino cherries that are interesting to me. And then I try to, you know, speak to them or supply the drink if we're going to stay with that metaphor. Right. So, 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 I mean, in a way you're taking what's, what's resonant and useful, you know, productive in this, context does that it just to i think part of the question was also the ideal reader question and 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 um i mean it 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 is that something you think about so i often find myself giving uh, writers the advice to magnetize their aesthetic by imagining kind of a beloved to whom they're writing so that all the iron shards of their thoughts are kind of you know going in one direction um but in this case, it was like a cry of the heart. Like, I think, was I imagining an ideal reader? I have found this book is weirdly, it seems to shake people up in a way no other book of mine has. And I don't, I can't quite put my finger on it. Other than that, it ha doesn't have the varnish of the other books. Um, but I think I was imagining anyone who's kind of, or has struggled or even imagined struggling with questions of being a child or being a parent, but is a kind of in a, wants to live a life of value and meaning and connection, but wonders about their own capacity for intimacy. I wanted, I wanted to liberate others the way that I feel I'm slowly being liberated. That's lovely. Um, I'm, I, we have a, a question also from, Susan Lippman, who asks what writers move and motivate you. And I'm just I'm just going to mention that then after that question, maybe we might turn to the passage that you shared with people so that we have some time to do that. OK. OK, so what writers move and motivate me? 
So for years, I used to say, um, and now he seems kind of cold to me, but I used to say my favorite novel because it's so well-crafted is J.M. Kutsia's Disgrace. Um, I just, you know, for years there was another book, um, Mating by Norman Rush, where a man writes in a woman's voice about Africa or, you know, or whatever issues of colonialism. Um, and then, you know, more recently, um, really last week, I read this the Chilean poet by Zambra and I was blown away. I felt as if it was Juno Diaz with heart. Mm -hmm. um, I have loved Mitchell S. Jackson's The Residue Years um, for this kind of similar reason. I like when people have, a, you know, that kind of, some people call it scaz, like a kind of, it's a Russian word, like a kind of jazz in the writing. So um, I liked, um, yeah, so combining high, low diction, being playful. Um, you know, I'm a fan of Claire's. Um, I so the book in the book it's mentioned that um, Grace Paley was significant to me in high school. I read her and I read just one book of hers, not her other book. You know, um, I read The Little Disturbances of Man, of Men, and there was something about the incredible concision and musicality, the cadence of her sentences which blew me away. Um, later, there was a kind of depressive, melancholic writer whose work was given to me when I came to college, Gina Berrio, her Women in Their Beds. I remember um, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, um, so yeah, so many, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, but right now, the, the thing I'm most excited about, I really, uh, there's so many Latin American writers, but um, yeah, this Zambra blew me away. That's do you do you read in Spanish or do you read in translation or? I read in translation, but it, you know I do, and I've done some Spanish translation. Um, I should read it in Spanish. It has that kind of cascading quality which Spanish has, and the translator of the, this new book, Chilean poet by Zebra, is incredibly faithful, yet uses English's Germanic etymology which gives it this greater visceral punch. It's an amazing translation also. Cool, cool, thank you, thank you. So I, I do, I wanna, you you took the, the time and trouble to send um, to send out to people uh, the, uh, a, an extract um, and it's quite short. Would you like to read aloud the, the excerpt and then, and then maybe um, we could invite people in the audience, I think it has to be in the Q&A form, I think just structurally, um, it has to be written rather than spoken, but but we could invite people to respond, so. That sounds um, great, okay, yes. And so before I read this, this is what my little dream vision is, and I want to put this out to you kind audience members, but I would like to create pods of three to five people who are engaged in discussion with one another, and then I will visit you. And I made a little Google form, which um, community books are can put in the chat at some point. Um, and you can just enroll in it if you want. And what I'd like to request as a new possibility um, is that you would meet like, and I will come for one hour um, and we discuss one passage in the book and we discuss how it relates to your lives and your creativity. This is what I want to do. I want to do this book kind of inside out. Um, I don't want to do too many more events, but I want to kind of just engage in discussion. I think that is more meaningful to me and everyone else and kind of a mission for me, like how do we make text meaningful in our time? So um, yeah, so please sign up for a pod if you want. So this is sort of in that spirit. Um, this is a section from the book and I, it's, I just, I chose it because it's a little meta. Um, it's about how the book was ordered. And I would like you to consider as I'm reading this, this question of whether or not these creative writing precepts actually are true to your own life. So, okay, I'll read it. Um, order. Roland loved shuffling index cards. Roland, as he has come to be known in our house in which my work on him 
was meant to keep some roof over our head. Since it is true, I have hawked everything, including the kid's own well-being and safety, to write a book on him which has not yet been written, kept playing with order. Any of his books could have achieved anything. How do you know when it should end? That a story resolves somewhere? Why not in another place? Roland, who forever questioned the binary, would wish to undo the myth of classical narrative as understood in the contemporary writing workshop to wit, someone has a goal and meets an obstacle. Less interesting choices are made between a clear good and a stark evil. The greater choice she, any character, makes between a good and a lesser good, an evil and a lesser evil reveals her character. Greater pressure begins as a result of her choice. We keep skidding ahead to the denouement in which we, if not she, are all the wiser. So yeah, I would just love to hear people reflect perhaps in the chat now, or perhaps we could do later if you join a pod and we can talk about that in maybe another section. But, um, you know, does it seem true to you that, you know, in your life, the most character revealing choices are made when you, between a good and a lesser good or an evil or a lesser evil, that life occurs in shades of gray. Does that seem true when you think of the really, you know, character defining choices, you know, maybe one or two choices in your life? Had, was that really the moment when your essence came to light? Question mark. So I don't know how to even do this because we're in a webinar where we can't see people's faces, but we can't, I know. But I, um, if maybe somebody has some has a response. Is it is it um what what what's your response, Edie? Classic psychoanalytic gesture. <laughs> um well, you know, I mean I'm I, I used to feel, for example, so I was a painter through most of college, but I there was a point where I put down my painting brushes in my last semester, and I said, I'm not gonna be a studio art major. And I got into this course with Peter Matheson, who was a mentor to Claire the year before into, you were in the class with Amor Tolls, right, as well? Yeah, yeah. But so, and Amor was the one who had said to me, you know, you should really study with this guy. So I was like, Okay, and I was, I'd been building up to do this final painting project with this amazing British guy, Andrew Forge. And I was like, no, I must study with Peter Matheson. And for some reason, and I never picked up painting brushes again, basically. And I was like, I'm gonna put it all into my writing. Wow. And, um, and so it was like a powerful no that led to a powerful yes. And I often find myself telling people this, that there are times when, you know, you really must, take that kind of bold move off a cliff. You know, um, it's not having a backup plan in some way in your own psyche. Um, but then I think about most of my life, like the larger percentage, and it's really more shades of gray. It's really more like a tendency or a tropism of, you know, a, a plant going toward light or kind of a, being in a, a slipstream or, you know, and then maybe I set an intention, like recently I've really tried to set an intention to be a more positive thinking person and stop my ruminative obsessive mind. But, and it's slowly seemed to help a little, it's various practices that I do try to do constantly because my mind always wants to kind of skew a little negative. Um, I don't know. So yeah, I'm curious what other people have to say about it. Well, I, we, again, we're inviting anybody who would like to share in the Q&A to go ahead and do so. I, you know, I think one of the things that, that really I hold on to in this passage is um, that a story resolves somewhere, why not in another place? And, and I think as for me as a, as a writer and as a reader, um, that, uh, that's, a, that's a very powerful question, which for me is linked now, I think, to that chessboard feeling right that that i actually feel as though you can take it, it's it's what you know flaubert said 150 years ago when he said i want to write a story in which nothing happens right right that 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 it, that in fact life itself 
any moment of life, whether it is the stark choice or whether it's the shades of gray or whether it's being in the slipstream or whether it's, um, I don't know, having some very um, tiny shift uh, in, in, in the person's perception, uh, you know, in the course of a conversation, I feel like it's all interesting. It's, you know, it's so much is so much is about the, the, the nature of attention that is paid. But but I think, you know, that uh, that's one of the joys of this of this book is that we precisely aren't um, we aren't reading again for that for, for, with some sense that 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 there's a, a, a traditional I, I, I almost feel, you know, I, I, I could you said earlier on, if somebody wants to pick a, a, a page between one and, you know, I, the final number is 300 and something, right? Um, but somebody, somebody could start reading almost anywhere and then, and then circle back and, and come to the beginning. Like it, it isn't, um, it, it, it is in that sense, you know, a, a new way. I mean, a revolutionary new way of, 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 of reading and writing. And of the interaction of reading and writing. I mean, or maybe it's ancient also, but it, but certainly it's it's made new in a Poundian way. It's made new here. So, um, Thank you. no, you know, it's funny because I did want it to be propulsive, like a narrative, where you wonder what's going to happen. Is it a cliffhanger? But I also wanted exactly what you like. Another another one of my favorite books is Hopscotch by Cortazar, where you can read it. You can choose your own adventure. Yeah. Yeah, but and and there is absolutely, I mean, there is absolutely an arc of 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 the narrative on uh, you know progressing and unfolding, and it is impulsive. Did you say impulsive, compulsive, whatever the word would be? It is, I like compulsive. I said propulsive, but oh. I like but compulsive is more community. <laughs> I see. So we so we have um so we have an answer which I think you can also see. Um, oh, in the chat. In the chat from from Nina, who says choosing between things that are not so stark opens to far more grappling and interpretations, the proliferation of interpretations. The door is open now and the mind frantically searches until it exhausts something else, exhausts and something else or something more emerges to make the choice. Um, Lorna McIntosh says, there's no chessboard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and Karen, Karen uh, Smythe says, or Smith, forgive me, says, yes to your question, Edie, I've made such decisions and choices saying no, leading to a powerful positive yes, other. And I think writing about interesting choices is fascinating, but I feel the publishing industry rewards the typical storyline, not the ending someplace else. So much to discuss on this. And, and we, do, I'm, um, we do have another question, um, which is from, Jim Carpenter, in your classes, do you suggest to your students that the classical narrative structure is a myth? These are great questions. Um, so, um, let me see, where are we time-wise? Um, I, um, not somehow all the questions disappeared, but I can remember them. Um, so classical narrative structure, a myth, that's, it. I mean, I mean, we need myths because they essentialize our experience and they organize it. And I often have this question, you know, my brother's a restoration ecologist and he'll we'll walk and he'll know the name of every leaf and twig and worm. And I used to say, no, isn't it better just to like be in like innominant experience and you're just feeling the totality of nature and you're not differentiating, you know, like Adam in the garden, you know, you're just like, ah, I'm in the myth. And where, but now that I'm, maybe this is some maturity for me. Now I think, okay, great to know that that leaf is, you know, acacia. And then you can see, okay, this acacia is like that. And then, you know, so what is the use of a word? So what is the use of a myth? You know, a myth organizes that phenomenon experience. And, you know, I, to my, so to that question, do I suggest to my classes that classical myth is, is 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 not is useful or um I, I i guess i'm just gonna go back to that idea of writing being a less than generous medium 
that you have to create a bovo from the egg like on your own and say that anything you can resist is a great gift because then it's a way of cheating your superego and letting the libido of your writerly self onto the page. You know, if you think you're responding to the myth of Philomela, you're going to write something more interesting than if you're just like, let me write about my morning lunch, you know? Um, and yet, and we have this substratum of myth and classical structure. They exist in us for some reason. I think it is probably just true that as Claire says, I have some allergy to hierarchy. So I'd like all, you know, and it's interesting, like even that question, it's like when you think of Indian painting, you know, it's a frontal plane where it's all times are happening at one moment. And, you know, that we have this Western conception, kind of a unilinear ascent and a crisis, at least a climax, and the denouement, like the Freytag's pyramid, is that what it's called? The kind of, you know, or even Aristotelian drama, it's like, you know, isn't our era more polyphonic? Don't we need some kind of new forms to emerge that have that relativism? Mm -hmm. Question mark. I don't know. I mean, maybe this is a question for the pots. It's it it, it I'm reminded. There's a. Um, I just want to say that the missing questions. If you click on answered, they'll be there. <laughs> Look at that. Or the missing comments. Um, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Um, but but. Um, the the writer Colin Tobin, I remember visited a class of mine some years ago, and he said, you can make up the plot or you can make up the characters, but you can't make up both. And and I, I puzzled for ages afterwards, like, is that true? Do I believe that? What does that mean? What but but I think in a way what he was suggesting was if you if you have something that's fixed that you can respond to in any way, and um, you know that, that if there's something that doesn't move, right? Something that you don't have to uh, that isn't that isn't fungible. So if you take a myth, or if you take a narrative, or you take a theory, if you take a, I mean, it, it's actually um, this is slightly different. But but as you as you um, probably know, Glenn Gould liked to practice with the vacuum cleaner on. Right, like that, that. That there's something about the sound of the of the vacuum cleaner that makes it possible, uh, when you're practicing, better to listen to your own playing. And that if you have that, that in it, you know, that in some way that that um, interaction or reaction um, can be can be fruitful, maybe. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering time wise. Maybe we have. Do we have time for a last question? Would we, is there anybody who wants to offer us or, did, or were there comments that you had might have on some of the responses that people had um, that, that, are, that are currently under answered, even though they weren't strictly answered? Answered, okay. Um, so what is a Bard book? Um, I mentioned uh, mythologies. Um, okay, let's see, uh, ideal reader. I think I answered that. Yes. What yes. writers move, okay. Um, Nina Schuyler's choosing between things that are not so stark opens to far more grappling and interpretations. Um, the door is open now and the mind, I just, I mean, this, I love this question. And the mind frantically searches until it exhausts and something else or something more emerges to make the choice. Um, yes. Yeah. So in some way, this comment or question by Nina, it's, it's like the agency I love to encourage in ourselves as readers, you know, as guides of our own lives, as readers of the characters of our lives. And I guess it's like the Bart pleasure, you know, the, 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 the writerly text where you're always aware of your agency in creating meaning. Um, let me see. Um, and yeah, I think that those are, those are the questions. That, I mean, am I not saying anything else? No. No, I, th I think there, there, there are comments, but but perhaps um, perhaps perhaps it's time. It's perhaps it's time to say a, a huge thank you, Edie, and to send everybody if you haven't yet had the joy um, of reading this book uh, to to go and read it. And if you have had the joy, spread the word. So thank you so much, Edie, and welcome back, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both so much for a really wonderful conversation. Those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of the book from us. If you haven't picked it up yet, 
Um, I also put a, a link to one last interview between um, Claire and Edie from the Rumpus recently, if you, if you want to read more. And um, thank you both. And we hope, we hope to see everyone at another virtual event soon. Um, thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Yay. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.